Okay, let's get started. First of all, I want to remind everyone that effective August 1st, you have to re-enroll in the Moodles, Health Science and Nurse Aid Moodle. You do not have to set up your account. It's already there. Once you enter the Moodle, as always, putting in your uh, information, then you will be prompted to enroll in whatever PLC that you need to. For us, it will be Health Science Moodle and the uh, Nurse Aid Moodle. So yesterday I realized that a lot of people were asking questions in the chats about CMS, how do you get to it, the course blueprints, the equipment list. So what I want to let you know is on the course blueprints, that is in the CT uh, e course management system. And that is located in the CTE NCCTE admin. So it dawned on me, you know, we are nurses. And we are so used to using uh, policies and procedures to guide us. And we like to have like a, to me, it's like using a cookbook. You got to have, you want to have your steps there. So just putting something on a PowerPoint don't necessarily help you. So where is CMS? And that is the course management system. It is in the NCCTE admin. And how do you get the NCCT admin? It is on the Nurse Aid Moodle. It is actually, you can see it to the right, you will see it twice. And a lot of you enter the um, NCCT admin to put in your um, your credentials. But if you, it's located on the main menu, and on once you're in, it's located on the main menu and on the course Moodle page. You just basically look to your right. So after you log in the Moodle, you'll see this, um, a screen that says course, um, NCCT admin. You look for the word main menu. If you click on that, you'll see where you see course, reports, profile, and link. You're going to click on course. This is where you'll find the course management system. After you click on that, it's very self-explanatory. There are some radio dials that you will look for. And on those radio dials, you can click on what you want. Um, for example, for the blueprint, you will click on course standards and you will see the course blueprint. You have to type in your course. For example, your course, if you're looking for nursing fundamentals, HN43, and it'll populate, and you will click on that to get it to populate into that space and just click. And your course blueprint will be there. There's also under that, um, when you're in the system, you'll see reports. That's where you will find your equipment guide. Under reports, you'll see equipment guide, course licensure, course standards, and credentials by course. The course standards is what used to be in the um, standards book that you used to get, tells you the prerequisites, how many students that you, uh, uh, enrollment numbers, that type of thing. So I hope that this has helped you guys with finding your, um, learning more about course management. I am going to go back a slide and I'm going to write in the uh, enrollment keys for um, person fundamentals. In the chat. And just so you know, remember these are case sensitive, but if you would just look and see, the only difference in the Roman key is instead of having 2015, it's got 2021. That is the only difference. I think the last time there was a change in the Roman key was in 2015 uh, when I first came to DPI. I think that's when it was switched over from ECU to North Carolina State um, in 2015. So that is really the only difference is the year.
Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I put the enrollment key in. So if you want to, you can uh, unmute mute yourself. Oh, good. Ashley's here. I didn't see that. And ask your questions, or you can put it in the chat. Anything about what I just talked about? What is the difference between two codes? Which two codes, Clara? You can unmute yourself if you can. If you're talking about the difference being the Moodle codes is um, Nurse Aid has its own Moodle page. Health Science has their own Moodle page. That is the difference. And Health Science 1, yeah, that's it. One is for Health Science, and then you have the Moodle code for Nursing Fundamentals. We have two different pages on the Moodle. Got it, okay. I think we got another question coming in, maybe. I'll wait a few more minutes. There is the health science um, code, Moodle enrollment key. And I'll put it in chat. I don't know if Ashley did or not. Okay. So we are going to move on. So one of the things I want to do today, since this is best practice, is dedicate the time to talking about the school year that we just completed. A lot happened. And I want to thank you guys for everything you did. I know I keep saying this, but you made it through. So all the crying, the tears, the frustration, saying words we shouldn't have said, thinking things we shouldn't have said, the number of times we quit and didn't actually quit, but it crossed our minds, but you made it through it. And we have another school year ahead of us. I don't know if any of you had an opportunity to listen to or even go back and listen to the recordings from the governor's conference yesterday at two. I actually pulled it up online yesterday afternoon and listened to it. And again, and I keep saying this, I don't know what the next school year is going to bring. Um, we don't know what's happening with the variant. There are more variants coming up um, with the coronavirus. So we just don't know. So we have to plan for the unknown. One of the things that was said that uh, Dr. Cohen said in her section of the conference was that they basically leaving everything up to each individual school system, but they want them to follow the um, strong school document that they have placed out on the Department of Health and Human Services website. So Hopefully, they're doing the same thing they did last school year, involving their local health department, the people that have the health background, to interpret this information for them and help them to make those decisions. I do know that what they said for high school students was the recommendation is for students that have been vaccinated, they're not required to wear masks, and students that have not been vaccinated and staff teachers and all are required to wear masks, uh, re yeah, required to wear masks. The lower grades, 12 and under, they have to wear masks. And this is only inside, not outside. So I say this to you because you have to follow whatever your local um, county is doing. So those are the, just like you did this past school year. Um, so face shields cannot replace masks because, think about it, put yourself back in a hospital setting, in a healthcare setting. That face shield does not provide any level of protection because it's still open. You have to have a mask on with the face shield. 
And I did see a lot of people out in public wearing just a face shield. And I wanted to go to them so bad and say, you really didn't have to have a mask on, should have a mask. But I resisted because people are so mean. <laughs> so I just kept going. Anyway, so let's talk about online theory instructions. What I want someone to volunteer to do is to talk about, and we're going to spend about 10 minutes on this, what you did for online theory instruction with your students. Like what platform did you do? How did it work? Were your students active? Um, just whatever you want to say about the online theory part of instruction. If you have any good ideas for other teachers, that would be great. You can also put the information in the chat as well if you don't want to speak. So I am going to be quiet. I'm going to mute myself for someone else to talk. Hey, Barbara, this is Beth Ashworth. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, one of the, the things that I chose to do in the, let's see, in the fall, uh, because we weren't sure whether we were going to have any skills and we didn't know how long we were going to be able to, to uh, not go back into the lab, what I did was front loaded the um, theory. Of course, uh, I had two classes. I had a year long and a semester long. So I front loaded all of the theory um, for the year long and for the semester. And that seemed to work pretty well um, in terms of not knowing what was going to be happening with the, the skill part. So I think that that was a good decision. Uh, hopefully I won't have to it, do that this year because ultimately it's not the best way for students to learn. Uh, it's theory and then you give a little bit of demo and then that seems to work a little bit better is my experience. Um, the other thing was that I used uh, Canvas. Uh, I used uh, a lot of online um, videos in Canvas to stress particular points, not skills necessarily, uh, but would uh, increase conversation. I used uh, um, games. I used um, uh, Quizlet. I used uh, a lot of uh, Kahoot uh, in my um, doing uh, my assessments and uh, doing the valuation of learning. So uh, it all worked okay. You know, it was just a matter of uh, what was not in the computer and what was not typed in, such as all of the lesson plans and all of um, the tests. I had to, to go ahead and put all of that in to the computer. So now this year I'll have that all together already. My plan for, for coming up, and the students did okay. I actually integrated another um, class from another school uh, whose teacher needed to leave on vacation or on, on a leave. And uh, so I integrated in some of different students from a different school into my students from my school. And uh, it, seemed to, it seemed to work okay. My plan for this year is to, um, is to use Canvas, is to use an online platform um, because I think it makes life simpler uh, than dealing with a lot of paper, uh, paper testing, paper evaluations, all of that kind of thing. So um, I'm going to just I'm going to blend uh, the um, online, the face to face, the demo, and um, you know, and hopefully it'll be a you know, a little better flow for the students. I know it was kind of choppy for them, uh, but um, I'm looking forward to to a good year. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. OK, does anybody else want to uh, comment on how the year went with online theory instruction, what they did? OK. Um, I do want to comment on Lisa Wilson and Libby, uh, Sylvie's comments about um, videotaping their lecture and they used, they flipped the classroom, they used Canvas. And 
um, they use their days in the classroom to um, for skills demonstration, lab practice, and things like that. So um, I think that was a wonderful idea, and I think um, you guys have to be forward thinking. You've had it's like Beth said. Okay, it was a choppy year. She um, learned a lot and got everything in. So she's starting uh, a new year. And I have to tell you, Gifford County was probably one of where Beth is at, one of the most restrictive counties on what they allowed their students to do for nursing fundamentals. So um, my concern this year is that you guys may get there in the fall and then you back on restrictions again. Mm -hmm. So that is one of my concerns, and I'm trying not to dwell on it, but I think if you look at what Lisa and um, Elizabeth are doing with their skills, how they're going to integrate it together, flipping the classroom um, to try to get as much done as possible. Because um, there's students need as much practice as they can get. Um, on things. We had people that use Teams for live instructions. A lot of you use Canvas. Mm -hmm. Canvas. I've never heard of Nearpod, so I wrote it down. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, mm -hmm. Gwen says they use Teams for live instruction. Canvas for, um, I don't know what HW stands for, and uh, school net for tests. Divided class into small groups to rotate through the skills time. So she kind of flipped her class and clinical in the hospital, followed local facility rules for spacing and numbers. Uh, somebody used Loom to video. You can see who has watched. She thinks they can. Mm -hmm. Flipgrid, I did play a little bit in Flipgrid. Um, Barbara. Uh-huh. This is Libby. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of the flipped classroom has been around a long time, and a lot of teachers, I think, have been doing some version of that. Mm -hmm. The thing with um, everything being turned upside down, literally, <laughs> when when you do a flipped classroom idea, it puts more in the student's responsibility to actually read, actually go through and do work. And it takes it and makes it more their responsibility. So you see really quickly who is going to be the best and who is going to be the ones that you will not have to worry about going to the non-practicum. Good point. Good point. Uh, we have a question for those of you recording your lectures how you ensuring the students watch aren't they in the class with you you just you flipping your class i'm not sure how y'all did the does anybody want to respond to that yeah barbara in terms of recording um you know we were asked by our principal to record uh our lectures and then um what i did was just go ahead and place them after i was done place them on uh the moodle uh, I, I mean, uh, Canvas site, and so uh, it was on the Canvas site for those who were who were not able to attend the live session, uh, so that they could get the information. Okay. Yeah, and that's another thing. You still may have some students that mm -hmm. parents won't allow them to come into the system. Yeah, we did that too. That was one reason that um, I did the flipped idea. That way, if they could not be at school for whatever reason, then um, we were OK. The good thing was my county wised up pretty quickly and decided that nursing fundamentals needed to be at school. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was one of the requirements. If you were in nursing fundamentals, you were with me at school. And that made a big difference after about October. That really helped. OK, yeah, so it's it's early. Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I was going to say, unfortunately, like Barbara said, we didn't have the option to do that until March, so of of 2021. So it was it was rather late. Yeah, but we did it. Yes, you did. You guys did. Yeah. 
So does anybody else want to add anything about online theory instruction? I think that was the easiest one to do. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on. Okay, <laughs> laboratory skills. So everyone knows that your laboratory skills have to be face-to-face. -face. That means um, instructor demonstration of the skills. Then you have students have to have time to practice. And then you check off for proficiency. Last year, we talked about that there were some skills, and I put it on the Moodle, that did not require the proficiency checkoff. And that was the work that I did with Guilford County. Um, the teachers uh, joined me in a, I joined them in their PLC meeting. And we looked at every skill. We touched every skill to see what could be done. Um, like on a PowerPoint where you're talking about it, for example, um, hair washing. You, you're not, I mean, we, the, you probably do demonstrate it in the lab with the mannequin and put in your head wash board or using some of the um, no rinse shampoos, telling them how they can do it and stuff. But that was not a skill that requires some proficiency checkoff. So those are skills that you talk about, that you taught them. And when I say talk, T-A-U-G-H-T, you taught. Um, another skill was um, the animals is down there. You know, you can't perform an animal, but you can um, show them the position with the mannequin, but that's one that you talk about. So we did that, I think it's like 45 skills. And the reason we did it was so that you won't spend a lot of your time on those skills and get stressed out because you needed to spend more time on those skills that needed to be checked off for proficiency. So again, I'm going to stop talking and let you guys put in the chat. Or uh, if someone wants to talk about what you did for laboratory, laboratory skills, um, what issues, what problems you faced, how you corrected those, or different ways that you did skills in the lab to stay within the guidelines that were given to you um, during the coronavirus. I, uh, Barbara, I'd like to ask Clara Thomas how she taught Enema with balloons. Thank you. <laughs> that seems like it would be. Clara, can you uh, share that? The only thing I can think of, she uh, taught it with a patient that couldn't hold it. It popped the balloon and let it flow out. I don't know. She's typing. Robin wants to know, am I going to send out an updated so list? Um, balloon. Okay. Oh. okay, she secured the balloon to the mannequins and inserted five milliliters. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, Robin wants to know if I'm going to send out updated info on skills that have to be manually checked off and which ones are only taught again. We really need to have an updated set for the new school year. There's nothing different about them. They are the same skills because skills have not changed. So it's the same skills, but um, I will send it out again. Um, I won't send it out till um, August after August 1st. I may be closer to when you get back into school to make sure everyone's in the Moodle. And it is on the Moodle under So we can use the same book. We can just change the date for the year. 
Which book are you talking about? For the skills checkoff that we um, print for the students. I still have to update that, but I'm not changing any skills. Okay. So give me time to change some dates. Okay. I don't think there are any dates on the skills. Mm -hmm. It's just that cover page. Just the cover page. Yeah. So if, if you want to just change the cover page, because I know a lot of you send stuff to print. I know Gifford County does and probably some of the other counties. You just change the date on your cover page and the skills themselves are not changing. Okay, Toby. I apologize. My little dog's kind of tired of me being on the computer all the time. Um, the oh, skills for the talk are under guidelines for skills laboratory during COVID-19. You need to look at that crosswalk that I have on there. Barbara, yes, ma'am. I guess I'm lucky with lab. I, since I have tables, I have enough for each person to have their own table. Uh -huh. So that puts them six feet apart. And so what I did is I would put like for vital signs, when we would start talking about blood pressure, we'd start talking about vital signs. Well, they would put what they needed on the table. And then we would go and rotate around to where each person was no long, no closer than three feet for less than 10 minutes. They had to be less than 10 minutes. So we just kept rotating and rotating, and rotating. And I know it seems crazy over three hours, you know, they're going to be together more than 10 minutes, but with everything, we were blessed. We were okay. The um, thing with lab, we have to remember with COVID is everybody has to keep their mask on all the time. And so I told them, I said, remember, you're like being in the hospital. If we were in the hospital right now with being a nurse during COVID, we would have to have a mask on all the time. So mm -hmm. it's like that. So you can't take your mask off. You can't pull it down to breathe. You have to keep it on. And getting them to think about what it would be like to be in that setting made it easier in the lab. Mm -hmm. That is good. You said something that reminded me of what the uh, Dr. Cohen said in the news conference yesterday. They changed the distance from six feet to three feet in the school system. That's one of the new updates on it. And that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. And you're absolutely right. They will have to keep their mask on. Yeah. Barbara, one of the things that I did um, is set up a behavior pattern that uh, was consistent with the uh, rules and regs for uh, COVID and for COVID safety mm -hmm. is that, you know, basically um, uh, an admission ticket to the, the classroom was following um, certain guidelines. And that was that the minute you come into the classroom, you go directly mm -hmm. to the sink you wash your hands, even if we hadn't covered hand washing yet, you wash your hands to the best of your ability, you dry your hands, and then you take a seat at your desk. Um, to uh, exit the room, you do the same thing. You, uh, the student would need to wash their hands, the student would need to take a wipe and uh, or take the wipe and do and wipe their desk, their bacterial wipe and wipe their desk mm -hmm. and then wash their hands. And that was the ticket out the door. So they got into a rhythm and a routine for that behavior to a point where I didn't have to, to remind them at all. They did it uh, routinely and and really, you know, it was. Um, you know, it, it, it started this accountability piece for them, like they were, like they knew that something important was that, that they needed to do because we weren't in the clinical area, but this, the stress of knowing that, or the, the indication that um, how important it is to wash their hands was being actually implemented in the classroom. So I'm, I'm, I am planning to do that again, um, okay. you know, even though it's not, 
maybe necessarily as stringent or as strict this time. It gets them in the habit of thinking about being in a an environment where they're going to wash their hands all the time. So, um, you know, it was it, it was every time that they entered the classroom, whether it was a lab day or any other day, every time they they came in the classroom. Of course, they all had masks on, but um, but I think that's going to be a good um, a very healthy uh, routine as well this time. Yeah, Thank Beth, you. do you have the little light where you can look at their hands whenever they're done? You know, um, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, the little glow. Uh, yeah, the glow thing. I don't, and I really want to to have that. I just didn't have a lot of time or you know preparation uh -huh. to get that all all ready. But but I definitely want to do that because that's that's a real aha moment for the students. Yeah, because what I was thinking when you said you have them to do that, whether you taught them hand washing or not, because you can show them what it looks like when they you know the first day of class after they wash their hands and they don't know any different. And you show them all the germs. But then, as you said, it was the exit ticket out. Stand at the door and show them. And as time goes on and they've learned proper hand washing technique, they realize oh, it's like they say, oh, it did make a difference. You know, I did have a quote from a student who said, uh -huh. Miss Ashworth, I washed my hands at home the other day and they just didn't feel clean like they do when I leave class. Yep. And so I washed them again the way we're supposed to. I said, okay, that's worked. <laughs> yes, yes. So does anybody else want to comment before we start reading the um, comments from the um, chat box? Okay, let me. Start from the top. Hi, it's um, Desiree Acevedo. Uh -huh. How are you, Barbara? Hey, hey how, are you? how are you? Good. I have a question. Um, are we still going to follow the restrictions with the linen when we get back into the lab, if we get back? Um, uh, when I sent you guys that information on the linen, that, linen, that was based off of what the recommendations from uh, Credential and Pearson View. Mm -hmm. Those are the recommendations that they sent to everybody for testing that did in facility testing. Okay. And um, those are, as I've been testing, I keep thinking, I don't know why we didn't do a lot of these um, things to begin with, such as why even bother to put linen on the bed? Mm -hmm. um, why, we, why, why we never changed our sheets in between the candidates? I changed them as evaluated when I had someone that was just constantly coughing in the bed. I changed the pillowcase and I changed the top uh, sheet. Um, but I'm going to get into some of those a little bit later. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. So we talked about the balloon for the man again. Um, Robin says... Uh, what is the COVID immunization policy for our nursing fundamental students? Talking to a local nursing homes, they haven't required immunization for all of their staff. So immunizations are basically whatever your facility requires, whatever those requirements are. If they are not requiring immunizations for their student for their um, for you guys, then that's what you don't do. If they require testing for your students, then that's what you have to do. They have to be tested. It depends on what's going on in that local facility. Um, before the vaccines um, happen, I, my niece is a nurse aide and they had to be tested, I think weekly, she said, uh, for COVID. Uh, and now they're doing spot testing as well. So follow your policy. Now we'll tell you this, if your policy, the facility that you're going to says that everyone has to be vaccinated. And I think I talked about this in their saying, you have to make the decision because if you have half your class that the parents said, no, they're not going to have their child vaccinated, then you have to make the decision. Do you do 
scenario. Do you take half of them? It's totally your de your decision on what you decide to do. But everybody has to get 40 hours of clinical in, in either scenario or at a facility. I want to comment um, on Clara's comment about the Perry area between leads. Some mannequins have rectal openings. Hopefully all of them have a rectal opening. I as an evaluator, and I, I know Donna Allen is an evaluator, um, and there may be other maybe other ones as well that I'm not aware of. But when you are teaching your students peri care, make sure you're teaching them to clean that rectal opening. That fails a lot of the candidates when they're testing. They wipe the crack. I'm just going to break it down. They write the crack, that's it. They don't get credit for writing the crack. They get credit for cleaning the rectal area. So they have to write that. Um, and the mannequins are required to have a rectal opening uh, for testing. So I just wanted to bring that point up since it's already there. Uh, talked about the move poodles. Uh, Gwen says her assisted living site required the COVID vaccine for all students and instructors in Concord. Debbie bought her light uh, for the glow germ, yep, yeah, at Lowe's and made a box uh, from a cardboard box. All I had to buy was the glow germ. She said it works well. What about long nails in lab? That's a good question. That is not a policy for the lab uh, that I have put in, that would be your own policy for your lab, because we all know that they can't have long nails when they go to clinical. There's no policy when they're testing. So if they have long nails, I think I got this question. So my students are testing and they all went to prom and they put long nails on. There's no policy saying they can't test because they got no nails. So that is a policy that you can put in, in for you because facilities, hospitals, they have that policy about long nails and they also have the policy about the artificial nails because they cause um, can cause infection, especially if they scratch a resident. So that's uh, you have to put that in as your own policy. Um, Beth says she restricts them. Clara says she follows the policy for nails for, as her clinical site, which is one fourth of an inch. That's a good way to look at it. That's what your clinical site requires. Uh, Katie says her students in summer clinicals at FTCC have been required to wear N95 masks and face shields and weekly COVID testing, depending on the facility, exactly. Mickey says she follows the guidelines of the long-term care facility. Gwen says uh, less than one-eighth for us. Uh, yeah, if you have them hold their hands up and turn around, you're able to see the nails are too long, yep. Does anybody else want to comment on their laboratory skills, how they uh, did those, what issues they had with laboratory skills? Well, Barbara, I think for, for me, uh, this is Beth again, I think that, that the, the, the lack of time uh, mm -hmm. made, made the, uh, the process of being checked off for the skills um, difficult. So I chose to have... Um, intensive workshops uh, basically on Saturday for the students to come in and um, practice and then get checked off on the skills. I had about two of those. Uh, they both lasted about four to six hours and um, it was highly encouraged and about 10 to 12 students showed up out of 19 uh, for the practice. So it was um, 
it, it was it was a good thing. It was well received and the students did show up. So I was I was pleased with that. But hopefully mm -hmm. I won't have to do that this time. We'll see. Yeah, but at least you got a plan. <laughs> hey, at least they got a plan and it was implemented. There's a precedent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Barbara? The, yes, ma'am. Um, this is Angela yes. Hamilton. Um, good morning. I, good morning. Um, I actually got little small plastic boxes. I, I want to say I got them at Walmart. And each student had their own box of supplies. Mm-hmm. And so I put a gate belt in, I put blood pressure cuff, stethoscope, one TED stocking and whatever. And so each student had their own personal uh, container. So when they did a skill, they used their own supply. So we didn't have to clean in between, you know, for the supplies, actually. And um, it worked well. You know, I held them accountable and they had to make sure they turned it all in at the end. And then I was able to clean everything and put it away. Um, now, not every school might have, you know, 20 TED stockings, but um, we were, I was able to supply my students with one of everything that would fit in that box. And that was easier for me than to have to clean everything every day. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that was a good idea. So that was another issue you guys had with the amount of time that you could be with your students for in the lab. Some of you were restricted on, like they may have given um, your school X amount of time, maybe three weeks to do the skills portion. Um, so did we've heard from Guilford County, Angela and uh, uh, Beth are from Gifford County. Did any other counties encounter that problem or were you restricted on the amount of time you could spend with them in the lab? And how did you work around that? Good morning. Good morning, Laquita. How are you? All right. In um, Winston Forsyth County Schools, the director set up a. Uh, we had a a form that the parents had to sign, um, letting them know that one we would be within um, with within the fifteen minutes together, more than that's supposed to be a liability way. But thank you, Laura. Um, with that, um, our principal day two, it had to be signed before we started any skills. When we went in, our principal did. Um, we, as a group at the Career Center, yes, we had um, mass, but we also, I mean, we had mass, but when they were within um, close proximity, we also had face shields. So they had on mass face shields. So literally, like putting on PPE. Mm -hmm. um, but working the skills, um, I, I just typed in that students knew to wash their hands when they came in and when they left, they had to wipe down the tables, put on gloves, keep gloves on, mask on, and then <clears throat> they learned to wipe down the beds, the pillows, anything they touched before they moved on to the next um, skill or location. Okay. Thank you for sharing. So I'm going to go through and look at some of the comments. Um, Wayne Bradley said they use Fridays for makeup CPR, uh, preclinical items like fit testing, drug testing, swallowing protocol, and hospital required modules. Now, Gwen was able to take her students to the hospital. She was one of the lucky ones. Uh, Wendy says students were allowed in person three days for lab until the last four weeks. Then it was allowed that they could come on campus daily. Uh, this is a spring class. Michelle says my county started off allowing students two days per week. So like I mentioned earlier, we used Canvas for theory and spent most of our time working on skills. I think most of you did that. Uh, Laquita and Laura talked about uh, the waiver. Um, Beth says that they tried to 
uh, put their supplies and use grocery bags with the students' names on, but she liked the bins better. Uh, Michelle says she did some optional Saturday skills practice, and um, she had a lot to show up. And some of you were very generous uh, doing prom to allow the nails. You made us, gave them, uh, allowed them to do that. Barbara says, uh, my students were face-to-face 100%. My principal backed us up for nursing fundamentals. Infection control, of course, was followed. All right. Um, we had, Vicki had a uh, liability waiver and strict cleaning pro procedures. I think she's out of Wilkes County. Uh, Mary from New Hanover County. Parents' uh, consent was required for our lab. Notifying of close contact with PPE students. Andrea Nash County uh, said her principal allowed my students to come to school each early each day. Oh, well, that's a good idea to extend our time together for skills. Students who did not want to do face-to-face -face were taught the non-practicum by our second nursing fundamentals instructor. Aquita says Dollar Tree has the Ziploc jumbo bags. Um, keep things separate. Uh, Vicki Wilkes County uh, said so they were able to take their students to long-term care spring semester with COVID testing required prior per the facility. Mary, again, out of Hanover, says her principal's backed her up four days a week. Robin says she had two students that the parents would not let come to school. I taught 1.5 to 2 hour private lessons woo, after school in the lab every day. Libby says she did 30 minutes early each day, and that was free practice time. Um, Quita said that they pair their students up so they can keep up uh, with tracking content. Contact, that's a good idea. So a lot of you had to make a lot of adjustments. You had to do a lot of things, and that was more work on you because you had to track. You had to keep up with all of this. Um, and I applaud you for that. Um, going above and beyond to get your students um, what they needed to do and to get more students out in healthcare, uh, which is where they are needed at. So we're going to move on. We did the questions. Um, now, the scenario driven clinical. Clinical is still 40 hours. You can choose to only do scenario driven 40 hours in your lab. Or if you are fortunate enough to go to a facility, facility being long-term care, assisted living, or a hospital to have your students um, perform their clinical hours, you can divide those hours up. Because I was so happy when I got the emails this spring. I didn't get any of them this fall. The only place that I knew that went during the fall was two schools, one in uh, Catawba County and uh, Cabarrus that were able to take them this fall to a clinical site. The spring of the year, things seemed to open up a little better. So when I got the emails, wanted to know, can I divide my clinical hours up? Yes, you can. You can do 30, you can do 20, you can do half of them, you can do 10 in uh, the facility. That gives some student, the students some hands-on experience um, as opposed to being with the mannequins or with a cooperative uh, client such as another student because we know sometimes in long-term care you're, or the hospitals, your patients aren't always um, cooperative. So I'm going to stop, let people talk about their scenario-driven clinicals, but I do want to make another mention that on the Moodle, we still have the scenarios that you can use. And if anybody wants to send me some scenarios, I will place those on the Moodle in the folder um, for the clinical, uh, I think it's labeled clinical driven, scenario driven clinicals, something like that. But you, it's easily labeled so you can see it on the Moodle. So I'm going to be quiet so we can have some share time.
Nobody wants to share their uh, scenarios, what happened, how did it work, how was it? Uh, do you feel Barbara, like it was a good experience? <laughs> Barbara, I just had a question. Um, going to Northern for fall semester is new for me. It's a new school. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what the situation is with actually being able to go to a clinical site. Mm -hmm. um, how far ahead do uh, clinical sites need to be scheduled for us to use them in a particular semester? So I know some of you start contacting your clinical sites while you're out during the summer. And I saw in one of our sessions, someone posted they con contacted a clinical site for, uh, I think it was for the fall, it was told to call back. So does anybody want to give her a general idea when they normally contact their clinical site for the fall or spring, how you do it? Barbara, mm -hmm. we don't, we have year long courses at career center. So, um, we don't usually go to clinical until end of January, 1st of February. And I usually contact them at the end of the school year for to get confirmation for the following school years, just so I would have um, some kind of documentation because um, they only allow one school in at a time. And we have Forsyth Tech students also. But okay. this year, um, I didn't do it because I didn't know what we were going to be up against this fall. So I did start contacting earlier this week and I'm running into all kinds of roadblocks where they are not, um, some places are not accepting. They're going to have um, so many different forms and um, stipulations that you have to meet. So um, I would say get started now because I'm, I've called probably four or five places in the last couple of days. That's outside of the three that we normally use because um, one of the three has already said that they won't allow students in in the fall. So they right. don't know about spring yet. Mm -hmm. And again, this is with clinical, it's one of those things that you have to call back or just wait and see. I'm having, hey, Barbara, this is Heather. Hey. I'm having a hard time getting our normal long-term care facility to call me back or contact me at all. They recently were taken over by a big for-profit company, um, and they've gone through like three directors of nursing, I think, in six months. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get in touch with an assisted living in the county, and they have like an Alzheimer's care unit and then an assisted living piece. So I was wondering if the Alzheimer's care unit could count as um, the long-term care hours, if they're full, hands-on, totally dependent. It will still count. You can use the assisted living. What county are you in? Watauga. Watauga, yeah. You can still use them because we have approved the use of assisted living. Okay. In the they past. Okay, awesome. I'm still waiting to hear back from them. I'm just... I'm thinking the nursing home I normally use is a no-go this year. Yeah, I think a lot of them might be a no-go. <laughs> yeah. So a uh, couple things, whenever you're looking at your clinical sites, you need to check the clinical sanction list. Um, Vicki has been sending me um, the, the facilities throughout. Matter of fact, this week, I think I've already gotten four emails from them. So um, I try to keep it updated. Also, don't forget your contracts with your clinical site, and you should maybe get help from that from your um, CT director or CTE staff. Kim, have you got a comment? Yeah, I was just going to, this is Kim Hitkiss from Lenore County. I was just going to ask if it would be advisable to go ahead and put where you think you might go or where you're going to try to go on your nurse aid um, program application form, even though you don't know if you're going to get to go there anyway. Yes, it is. I still have the same instructions on the nurse aid application that says it's right below, uh, right above where you're going to put in your clinical site information. And it says, please list um, 
I want you to list your clinical site and I want you to list your school lab. Just put your school address. Your principal is your administrator. So I want you to do the same thing you did last school year. Okay. And that way you won't have to, let's say, Kim, you have a fall class and your clinical site says, no, check back with us for spring. You call them in the spring and they say, sure, you can come in and you meet with them. This is what requirements you have to do. Once you have met with them, you don't have to worry about contacting me because they already approved on you, on your application. You can just keep going. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, you're you, thinking Mary. right. So I'm going to go up and start looking at some of the questions. We have um, lots of comments and questions. So I'm going to start with Stephanie. She says, I just want to clarify, if your facility requires vaccines and some students do not and will not get uh, the vaccine, you may go back to scenario-driven clinicals. All students must stay together. If I was doing it, if all of them couldn't go to clinical, none of us would go to clinical because I think it'd be better to keep them all together um, because you run yourself ragged. Um, and you've already, I mean, you guys go way above and beyond. So it'll be all or nothing for me. But that's your decision. It is not my decision. That's the decision you have to make. Uh, Michelle says we were able to find assisted living, so we divided ours between ALF and Scenario. Yes, it worked great. So she, her students got some hands on. Um, and when Gwen says you can't split up students, and lab and facility. You can only split up students. Gwen comes from a, a, a big academy. They got more instructors. If you're a one man show, then you can't, I wouldn't split myself up. But if you have a certain second instructor that could take students to clinical and you stay in the lab with the other ones, you could do that. But if you're a one man show, you, you can't, it's hard to do. For clinical sites, the facility or facilities you choose has to be listed on the sanction list in order to be able to perform clinicals in that facility. That's kind of backwards. They cannot, if they are on the sanction list, you cannot go to that facility at all. The sanction list uh, are those facilities that have had surveys or they had a survey based on a complaint. If the Department of Health and Human Services substantiates or have any substantial findings and they are we are fined and some of them pay big dollars, they will not allow any nurse aid training to take place in that facility. And that includes that facility training, offering a class themselves, no outside uh, nurse aid training programs are allowed to go into that facility. So if you're, if the site's name is there, that means you cannot use them on, if they're on the clinical sanction list. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Gwen says ASP notifying the clinical site. Um, Susan says she usually makes her contract at the end of the school year for the next year. Andrea says she tries to set it up before the fall, for fall before she leaves for summer break. Uh, Beth, Heather says she usually contacts them during the first few work days of each semester and plans out on her pacing guide uh, to make a rough estimate of the dates. Uh, Susan says even with restrictions, she thinks she's going to contact just in case, exactly. Julie says, I had my students make up one scenario for an assignment. Oh, okay. Of course, I had to add some information to some of them. No student used their own scenario. They enjoyed researching some of the skills that would be needed to be completed on the, their residence with certain illnesses. Uh, Julie, are you able to unmute? I'd like to hear what some of the students' um, scenarios were like. Yeah, she must have came in on listen only. Diane says, uh, make sure that you have all legal documents completed through your county 
uh, where is your admin support on this? That's true. Uh, Angela says, call before school starts. And you can check with the previous teacher to find out where they went. Um, now, I like Lisa's comment. She said she was very lucky that she was able to have visitors come in to be patients. I put the need out on Facebook and had former students, patients come in, parents come in. I used the scenarios on Moodle and made up some of my own based on what I knew students needed to be checked off on. It was interesting and thankfully we were able to get 10 hours in long-term care. They actually, they actually called her. You may have them calling you. That's true, that's true. Okay, Ellen, you gotta clarify. Okay, can you explain the policy to follow when or if a student misses a lot of class time, non-COVID related or do not meet? Proficiency in the skills lab or her class average of less than 75. At what point in the semester, just before clinical site dates, uh, end of class time, end of theory class time? I know these are requirements to meet to continue on to the clinical or be placed in non practice. So basically, what she's asking about is when do you, what do you do, how do you determine when to move them to non practical? So let's start with attendance. Um, there is no policy from DHSR, there is no policy from DPI on class attendance. The only thing that DHSR says is that students must make up time missed because that time, that total time goes on their certificate of completion. So if you've got a student that missed 20 hours total time, they have not, and you can't put 270 on their certificate because they didn't get 270 hours in, but they have to make up that time and they, it has to be tracked. So um, the other thing is if you have students that do not, um, that miss a lot of time, theory is easy to make up because you can, they can read that, study it and take the test and pass. The problem's going to come when you start doing the skills lab. They have to be able to check off on those. They have to get the instruction. They have to have practice time. And then they got to check off on proficiency. There's not enough time for them to practice to get that proficiency. The chances of them checking off will not happen on skills for proficiency. You all have your rubric for their skills. You know your cutoff point. Some of you do different. Some of you expect 100%. Some of you will let them miss one or two skills. Uh, I don't think, and I, I know none of you go below 90, 95, or anything like that. So that's your cutoff point for the skills proficiency. Some of you have students that you wait till the last minute, the day before clinical, to get them checked off on proficiency before you determine, because you want them to go to clinical. So you wait to the last minute, you say, this is your last time. If not, I have to send you to HN42. So therefore you need to have that plan. It's like having a plan A, having a plan B. Now the class average of 75 is only for to sit for the nurse aid certification exam. So I'm going to take you back a year, up to school year um, 18, yeah, 18, 19. God, I'm getting them back. Last school year was the first school year um, that we had to, which was 2021, that we switched to um, the certification exam being your proof of learning. That is when, if they, before that, if they, after clinical, if they still have had an average of less than 75, they had to take the uh, post-assessment exam, okay? There's no more post-assessment exam for these students. So as of now, if they don't have an average of 75, then they are not eligible to sit for the nurse aid certification exam. Hopefully clinical brings them up, but hopefully 
they don't even get the clinical because nine times out of 10, they have not met the proficiency to get to clinical because if they, because they have to score a certain amount. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, Robin, would you put in the chat if that makes sense to you? Uh, I'm gonna go down to here so I can see her. Uh, Julie says, "I just, I was just told, I just told them to make sure the scenario used a certain number of skills. They made up interesting names and situations." That was Julie's reply. Uh, she couldn't unmute. She says, "Some use family histories. One had a grandmother who recently passed away, and she had." been under hospice, she had cancer. One student actually had been in the hospital after an ATV accident and used her own situation, okay? Uh, Diane Wall says, I would bet the vaccine will be fully approved and that it could be, then will be made to be mandatory. I don't know, we'll see. Okay, how often is the sanction list updated? The sanction list is updated depending on how and how often uh, Vicki Ford, one of the nurse consultants that you met in the, that was at the nurse aid update, she's responsible for sending out those sanctions. So it depends on when she sends them out. Like I know this week alone, I have at least three emails from her. So Monday morning, I will update it. Because um, it's not in time this week. So it'll be a new sanction list on Monday morning um, or sometime Monday. So it just depends on how often I get them from her. Is there a due date? Not sure if I understand that. Due date for what? Can you clarify that, Clara? Richard says, if you if that's the solid game plan, we'll cut down on reapplications. Exactly, he's talking about the uh, putting your um, information for your clinical, and you don't have to apply again if you did not put down your clinical site. Now, I got some emails from people um, this past school year that was going to a different site because they found one in their county that will let them come. All you have to complete is the clinical site change form. And you email that to me. And I, I know I got one from um, Chatham County, um, from them. All you do is you email it to me. I verify if they're on, or I check to make sure they're not on the clinical sanction list. And if they're not there, then I tell you, I approve it and send it back to you. And all you need to do is add that uh, clinical site change form to the front of your nurse aid training program application that I sent back to you. Um, Michelle says she took what was off the Moodle. This is for her um, scenarios, as well as another teacher shared some of them. Then I embellished it and added some more of her own scenarios. I placed each scenario in a white, in a wipeable report cover and slid it into the pages. She did a protector sheet, one of those report sheets. She said she would divide, divide the students up, maybe one being patient row, one to two A rows per scenarios, and then they could read scenarios. Look at the care plan um, and what they had to do, bed, bath, kids, mouth care, et cetera. Once they did that task, they would document on the form, their INOs, vital signs, et cetera. So that was good. So I am going to um, go forward because I want to talk about uh, the skills. Now, what I have done is I basically took what um, Prudentia and Pearson View had on their slides and to show what you guys did with the skills. Um, I not didn't put any type of comparison to the state. I just put exactly what we did. And this is what they had on their graphs was for the two school years. 2019, 20, and then 2021. So the first one they had on was applying knee high stockings. And I looked at the ones that were below 90%. Uh, school year 19, 20 were 89%. And then this school year, we went up to 92%. So dresses client with affected weak right arm, 87%, a little bit up to 89%. 
performs range of motion 85% and 88%. Performs range of motion of the shoulder 82 and 90%. Position on the side 88 and 90%. We're not doing mouth care as a skill, so that's why you have an NA for uh, school year 2021. Provides perineal care, 89 versus 93. That went up this school year. Transfers from the bed to wheelchair went up a lot, 84 to 91%. Counts and records the pulse, 92 to 89% of this school year. I'm going to move kind of quickly through this because I want to get to something else. The overall pass weight compared to school year 1920 uh, with 77, we went up 2021 20, to 81%. So, your bi-portal reports, Aaron mentioned these in the nurse aid update, are sent out the 15th of the month, and it's received the month after your student's test. This report goes to your CTE director or to whoever they've designated. What I need you guys to do is start asking to see these reports. Your bi-portal report is a pass-fail. It just tells the list of students that took the exam. If you had students that took the exam uh, this month, the CTO director get that report in August. It'll say pass-fail, list of students. And it also lists the skills that they uh, pass failed. Now the training report is for all of your students, but it lists it only by skills, not by the students' names. This report is very important for you guys because you can get that report and see if you have a trend. And when I say a trend, if you have a lot of students that have missed the same step, there's a reason why. That means either they didn't understand what you they were taught, or they were practicing it incorrectly in the lab and it just wasn't caught. I had an instructor tell me that the uh, nurse aid evaluator said to her, those students were taught that. As an evaluator, and I think did, uh, Donna would agree, we can tell a trend. And even though I test regionally, I kind of think, well, they must have been to the same training program because they're making the same mistakes. And then sometimes I hear them talking and I realize, yeah, they went through the same class. We can tell when someone's been taught something um, and didn't know to correct it. And it wasn't about nerves. So that way you can look at it and say, okay, I need to teach this a different way or maybe they didn't understand it. So that's, that's why them, uh, those reports are important. So, uh, that uh, DHS, not DHS, uh, Pearson View and Credential took those missteps and they looked at whether the what percentage was the highest so far as privacy, uh, not giving the signal device, washing hands, uh, if it was a critical element. So I'm going to take the first skill is dress as the client with a fake to weak right arm. Um, there were 10% of them that failed to provide privacy. So if you look at the other steps to this skill, um, I'm going to go one more. The critical element was assist to put the right arm uh, through the right sleeve of the shirt before placing garment on the left. That was 6%. And I know a lot of you are saying these numbers are not high, but they only need to fail one skill. Signaling device not given, 4%. And after completing, completing the skill, wash hand, 5% fell back. So let's look at dressing the client. I'm going to go back to the first skill, first step of part of it. I can tell you right now, with the privacy curtains, the trend that I have seen is they go pull privacy curtains. They do this. They have to actually pull the privacy curtains. I know in high school, we don't allow them to pull the privacy curtains um, unless you are there. 
if that's the case, when you start actually practicing with them, they need to pull privacy curtains. They need to get in the habit of doing that. The other thing you can do, and I've seen this with a lot of training centers that I've done some in-facility testing on, they'll do things like safety checks. I hear the candidates say safety checks. They'll check the bed, they'll check make sure they got the call bell. They'll uh, check to make sure this one drives me crazy when they start pulling up all the railings. I think, oh boy, somebody got some retraining to do on you. Um, so far as that concerned, but it's already embedded in them. <laughs> Pull up all those railings. So um, then they also have, you can also have them at the end of their skill to turn around to make sure um, that they have given them the call bell. Or you can include the privacy as part of a safety check as well. Those type of things get ingrained into them. So on um, step number seven, I'm going to tell y'all a little bit of information about um, dressing. Step number five says, Removes the gown from the left side and then removes from the right side. Make sure your students know the right from the left. There's no shame and there's no crime in them turning around as if they're lying in the bed and going right, left. There's no shame in that. That prevents a lot of errors. So teach them to do that because uh, they're under a lot of stress and pressure. And unless you're in that testing event with them, and they've always had been calm. I've had them coming in crying. I've had them coming in saying, I can't do this. I mean, I've had them coming in just crying all through the exam. So it's a lot of pressure for them. They have to put that gown in the hamper. They cannot put it on the that's our table. It must go in the hamper for step number six. So if they do, don't do that, that's a no. Number seven, assist to put the gown on or the sleeve, the shirt in the right arm first. If they dress the left arm first, that means they're going to miss step eight because they have applied four. Step eight says, while putting on shirt, moves body gently and naturally, avoiding force and overextension of the limbs and joints. That is referring to that right arm. Remember, it's a weak right arm. So if they are putting that on last, they force that arm. So that's one way that you can get them to understand that they make sure that they're following the step correctly. Again, the signal device. The signal device, I have tested candidates that have not, by the time they get to their third or fourth skill, they finally remember to give them the call bell. Have them turn around and look to make sure they've done everything before they say their skill's complete because they can make corrections, okay, up to that point. So passive range of motion of one knee and one ankle, that's another skill that um, a lot of candidates fail. Privacy again, 12%, step number two, they're not providing privacy. Your critical element here in this step or the critical step is number four, it the, addresses the support. By supporting the leg at the knee and at the ankle, you bend the knee, and then return the leg to uh, the client's normal position. You have to make sure that they provide that support. It has to be at the knee and at the ankle, not at the heel, but at the knee and the uh, ankle. Again, it's about support for number five. They have to put their support at the foot and the ankle. And they, if they raise up from the bed too far, or uh, if they're too close to the bed, if they are flat on the bed, then they will not get this score. That would be a no. 
anywhere there are multiple steps, uh, multiple steps and things they have to do in a skill, they have to do all of it to get the full credit. So let's say they did support it, the foot and the ankle, but they were flat on the bed. So the rationale behind that, they are causing friction for that heel. So they want to have make sure they have the leg up when they're doing the um, ankle part. Signal device, 6%, and washing hands, 5%. I picked those skills to highlight them because they um, were the ones that were highlighted um, on the chart that Pearson View and Credential had um, to go over those skills. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, see if anybody has any questions at this point um, so far as testing. Go back to the top. Hey, All right, this is Ashley. There was one question that was posted earlier in the Live Now Questions tab. I wasn't sure if you were able to address that for Miss Armstrong yet. Is this the one about the? What is she asking? I'm looking through. Them. It says, um, "Who will be our lead RN with hours of nursing home care for application of fundamentals programs?" Who will be our lead RN? You are now. Say that again, Laura. This is Laura. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we do our applications, we have our school nursing fundamentals RN teachers, but then we have to list one for the county that, um, and I think the one that we've been using was um, leaving this year. I can't remember who it is. Is it Pam? Is it Pamela Laura that's leaving? Um possibly. We we only had to use her, I guess, last year. We used we her for two years. She was at East Forsyth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Pamela Ward. Is that who you used? Yes. Yes, she did. Is she leaving? I was under the impression that she was, but maybe she's not. Okay, I'll send a message real quick and ask. <laughs> so, Laura, let me uh, clear you up. You're not talking about your lead, or you are talking about a program coordinator. That's what Pam was for your county. Yes. She was on record for all of the schools in Forsyth County as the program coordinator. Correct. So, if she is leaving, then you guys would have to find another program coordinator. Yeah. And the requirements for the program coordinator, if you look on the PC agreement, at the very top, it tells you the requirements. One of the requirements for a program coordinator is that they have to have at least one year experience, 2,000 hours in long-term care facility. So it could be a nurse that's worked in a long, it's nurse that worked in long-term care, either as a, a staff nurse, program um, staff development coordinator, assistant DON, DON. Y'all may have someone, a teacher that has done that. Uh, that's something you'll work with uh, Vicki Wheeler on um, to try to get someone in your county to do that. If you have problems, then that's when you'll need to contact me if you simply just cannot find anybody. Okay. Okay. How long does a teacher have to teach um, nursing fundamental going in and out of the long-term care facilities before they can be a program at? It adds up to about 25 years, and it depends oh. on how many hours you actually do. Now, a teacher that has taught in um, the um, community colleges, you know, they run their classes at Wake Tech. As soon as we finished the class, we didn't even have a week no time in between we started the next class so we were in and out of long-term care a lot whereas you guys only go in once or twice a year 
and so if you find someone that has been teaching at a community college for, I mean, several years, we can figure it up. They just have to be able to tell me how much they were in long-term care, how, how many hours they did in clinical every time they went. Like if they went, they know they went five times a year to clinical and they did, uh, like Wake Tech, we did 40 hours. If they did 40 hours every time and they've been teaching for 20 years, I can figure that up to see if that would be enough time. Barbara, you might want to look at the last few that popped up about program coordinator questions. Okay. Can the PC that is a non-teacher access the Moodle to stay up to date? Um, you have to give them access to the Moodle. Um, and that would be the decision from your uh, county, because I know some of you do use um, the assisted living, um, not assisted living, long-term care uh, staff development coordinators, and you also use the uh, DONs and assisted DONs. Angela, you got a question? Yeah, what is the hour requirement? Uh, is it, you said it'd take 25 years, but... It's 2,000 hours. It's a full time. Uh -huh. Okay. 2,000 hours. Okay. Yep. 2,000. Does hospice count as long term uh, care? Hospice does not count as long term care. Okay. It is on your application. It says hospice will not count. It's on the uh, faculty approval application. That's where it's at. Okay, Jennifer says, I don't think I have a program coordinator for my program, but I don't think I have ever put down a coordinator. Yes, you have, Jennifer. Um, you have, because I wouldn't have approved your application. Well, then it must have been you then, my dear. I think it was me. I will be <laughs> program coordinators for some programs, um, but I kind of limit the number. And as soon as I approve an application, what I'm doing now is you submit it. If a teacher submits an application to me and I see long-term care experience there and it's 2,000 hours, which is a, a year, I go ahead and approve them for program coordinator. Got it. Well. Okay. Pam Ward just um, texted me back and said she is still at East Forsyth. Okay. Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so Claire says, will it sit? But... Claire, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Uh, would Elizabeth City be my CTE director? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Are they permitted doing testing to say, oh, I should be putting on the right side and then co correct to pass? Okay. With testing, when I have someone that says that to me, oh, I should be putting on the right side, I say to them, are you making a correction? Or is that a correction? Most candidates would say, yes, I, I am making a correction. Remember, candidates are only scored on performing their steps. The only time that they are scored can tell the evaluator what they're going to do is when they say wash hands between skill steps. So whenever they make a correction, the evaluator will ask a question such as, when would you have done that? And they give them the answer. Then the evaluator is going to say, please perform that step or steps if they're correcting several steps. Yes, Beth, uh, Vernon has already told me that you're going to be the program coordinator. Uh, I am. I, Angie just said that Charlotte Cook was. I thought she was retiring. At the end of the school year, she changed her mind? Yes, she is working one more year, but now if ah! Vernon... <laughs> okay. One more year, she said. Um, but now, if Vernon wants to go ahead and put uh, Beth as that, because we know Scarlett's retiring, that is up to Vernon. So we'll reach out to Vernon and make sure. Yeah, he he only told me that whenever I told him that, uh, reminded him that Scarlett was talking about retiring in the school year and that um, I had that Beth 
was approved for a um, coordinator because I'd already started looking because you guys got a lot of programs. Right. Yes. Well, I, we'll reach out and make sure that we know before we start sending our applications. It's up to Verdi. He may want to go ahead and switch it over. Yeah. You know, so. okay. okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Angie. That's Thanks that. for clarifying that. Uh -huh. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Clara, um, I think because you guys didn't teach it last year, so your application is not on my mind. I think you're talking about Hughes. I think she is your program coordinator. Okay, Marie Mead, with the time we have been teaching nursing fundamentals plus other experience counts, long-term care experience program coordinate. Yes, if you can if you can document or provide me documentation, and that would be on your um the application, faculty approval application of your time in long-term care, then I can I will approve that. I may have to call you to verify some of it, um, but you have to have those 2,000 hours. So if you've done, if you've been working PRN, are you working the summer in a long-term care facility or have done it 20 years ago, it still counts as long-term care expense. Um, Katie says, for perineal care, the students need to put a towel over their gown to cover the chest or is the gown sufficient? I know in step six, they are only exposed between the hips and the knees, but want to see if they have a gown on that covers the chest. Is that okay? So you don't have to cover because the gown covers um, still provides the privacy. So the privacy refers to you can't pull the cover back down past the knees. That's the note. It has you have to pull the cover up to the knees and you got your gown there. So you basically have privacy uh, covering the client. Let's see. Uh, can you touch on peri care with the washcloth? I started with bath mitt, but I was taught. But really um quickly realized that was wrong so the thing with peri care that i think a lot of people are missing is it always has to be a clean washcloth you cannot go back and use rinse out that same bath cloth that you used the first time for uh, washing you got to always start with a clean bath cloth for wash rinse and then you got to dry with the towel okay so the front has to be all clean washcloths when you're doing the back, you have to use clean wash washcloths as well. So far as a mitten, however you want to teach your students to do the uh, washcloth, it's up to you. I never got the mitten and I was taught in the 70s and we, we had to use a, the mitten format. Uh. <laughs> The four corners, the thank you, Mickey. Using four squares with the washcloth is much better. Also, when they are doing pair care and catheter care, doing testing, they only have to do one wipe. You don't have to have them keep um, wiping again because that is when they mess up because they forget to use a different side of the cloth. Okay. So remember, you're teaching them how to provide care the correct way. But then once you're done with clinical, you need to start teaching them how to test. And you're only testing for minimal competency. Okay. Uh, the fan fold method, whatever method works best for you. I think the I don't know about the fan fold method. The peri care. Are uh, there in a hospital area? Are there are there any hospital areas? Where are we? We can count. We have, okay. So what area of the hospital can you count? You can count any area that has medical patients. So um, rehab, neurointensive care unit, if you are allowed to go in those areas, you can, you can use those areas for your um, clinical site. Surgical. You cannot count because um, you you want a certain age population. You can't use mother baby because you won't find uh, the elderly there. 
So you have to look at the type of floor you're on. So rehab, NIC, uh, newer intensive care units, those we count. Uh, they're dropping in here so fast. Uh, Sylvia, I'll have to look back at your application to see if you have long-term care in there, then I could approve you. And you can be your own program coordinator for your um, program. Did that one. Did that one. I think I'm call up. Okay, Clara, are they permitting doing testing to say I did that one? Okay. Did that one. Barbara, I had a question about range of motion that okay. I had put in there. Okay, I see it. Go ahead. Um, I just need clarification. When it says either one of the range of motions that you have to hold, like the knee, do, does it matter if it's the knee on the top of the knee or the bottom of the knee, behind the knee? Okay. So, as so long as you are supporting it, because uh, it doesn't say, and Donna, you may have to help me with this one. Um, let me look at it. It doesn't say where to provide the support. And we just got a lot of clarification from um, Prudential about this. Uh, it just says supports at the knee and at the ankle. I give them credit if they touch the knee or the ankle. So um, I'm going to get more specific clarification on that. And I'm saying this is because based on the information that we just got some clarification on for providing support, um, they've told us to count the heel as providing support. So. I don't necessarily agree with that. So let me, I, I'm going to email uh, Credentia and uh, get clarification on that for you. And I'll email it out, um, send it out through the Moodle to everyone. Thank you. Because I want to make sure I give you the right answer per what the evaluators are testing for. Okay. Hey, Barbara. Oh, uh -huh. Sorry. Hey, Barbara, this, this is Beth again. I just wanted to uh, just get some clarification on just a little sticky point of uh, kind of a little rough patch of where the students were, were learning the, the skills in our um, in our skills book, uh, not the, the handbook, but the, the actual skills book. And then uh -huh. they transitioned to, uh, you know, practicing via the candidate handbook. Now, uh -huh. I noticed that some of the steps are different um, in the skills, our skills, uh, you know, notebook and uh -huh. the candidate handbook. And the differences are slight, but it seemed to seem to rattle a couple of students' cages. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, sometimes washing the hands would occur earlier than it did in the handbook you know what do you so mean by like, earlier so i think there was there, there was one where um oh gosh let me let me just try to think of something where they um actually i can't think of it right now but it was gosh gosh Sorry, I Sorry, can't. I, can't hey, Beth, I think I know what, Beth, I think Go I know ahead, what you're talking about. I think there's a like a difference between washing your hands and then giving them the call bell. Where exactly. some of them, where some of them said, um, "Give yep. the call bell and then wash your hands." I think that's correct. What you're talking about. Desiree, mm -hmm. that's it right there. Yeah. And um, so, so I think you know what I understand in in my learning curve is that what they want in the handbook, as you said, was just the minimal. 
requirement. And they're, mo they're modified. Modified requirement. But but yeah. in the notebook, it seems to go into more detail. Um, so I guess just basically kind of teaching the students up front that that's going to be happening um, may be helpful so they're not given that information right at the moment that they're transitioning. So I'll just prepare them a little bit better for that. And and maybe, you know, just do take a cursory look at the handbook before or as we go along looking at the notebook. Um, maybe that would be be helpful too. So thank you. Also remember they only have 30 minutes to take their tests, the skills. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason they don't have all the steps to mm. them. And another example is range gotcha. of motion. Gotcha. That's not all the steps for range of motion. It, it exactly. Is, so yeah. it's they're, they're modified, they're minimal competencies is what it is. And then for the curriculum skills, um, if I made any changes to them over the years that I have been here at DPI, I have put down at the bottom my reference, which is one of the um, textbooks mm -hmm. um, that I use. Because uh, they send me free copies, which is wonderful. So I use them and you guys can get free copies of these textbooks too. All you have to do is contact the company. Cool. All right. Well, I, yeah, Barbara, thank you for that. And, that, and thanks everybody for, for clarifying that. Um, that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think I was trying to go through the question. Actually, have I missed any? Because they were coming in here quick. Yeah, right about the washcloths, you touched on that in parent care. I don't see Megan Gambles. I didn't see hers. Peggy, Perry Care. They can do only one white. Yes, they can. For the front, one for the back. That is sufficient. How do they cover everything with one white? You just make sure that they got enough of that white for that they just going down the front of that uh, mannequin for uh, Perry Care. And then they just pick up another cloth that's clean wet it in the water, take it, and they have to hold it so it's just covering everything in the front. In the back, you, they got to hit that anus. They got to hit that hole in the mannequin because that's what I'm looking for and that's what evaluators look for. And all they do is they just start from the bottom of the mannequin and go up to the crack. They've done it. Put that washcloth down. Get a run the rent, start from the back at the vector area and just go up and then dry. Same thing. There yeah, are questions that. on the book resources. Okay. So let me ask them this one real quick. Where is that critical list? Uh, Maria, if you're talking about the skills, they are listed in the book, they're bold skills. No, so she says, never no, mind, ha <laughs> ha, I found yeah. it, okay. <laughs> I was talking about the program uh, coordinator. Coordinator. Uh, yes, but oh, okay. I'm good, I'm good. Okay, now the book resources, I will post those in the Moodle. Uh, there are two books um, that um, have been published for Nurse Aid. One is, um, what is that company that I always get confused? Um, she now works for um, Reality Works, the company she came from. Good Cox, Goodwill, Good Cox. Good Heart, Good Heart Will Cox. Yeah, they have a book, and then um, there's another company that has a book. I will um, put that on the Moodle too for everybody. Send it out. Barbara. Uh huh. Going back to the question about. Um, when the students take the gloves off and then give the call bell versus give the call bell and take and then take their gloves off and wash their hands. I always try to tell my students it's a cleaner skill or a dirtier skill. So if they've had their hands in water and all that kind of thing, they don't want to take that glove and give them a call bell. Yes. 
That is correct. That okay. is correct. Okay. Yes, Robin, that is correct. They only have to do one swipe, wash and rinse and dry, just one swipe for catheter care too as well. I mean, when, cause some of the scales, they do get confused when some of the scales tell them at the end, take your gloves off, wash your hands, and then go give the patient the call bell versus uh -huh. give them the call bell, then go wash your hands. And I always tell them if it's a cleaner scale, your hands aren't filthy with bath water, then it's okay to give them the call bell with that hand. But if it's a dirty skill where they've had their hands doing peri care and cath care, then they need to take their gloves off, wash their hands, and then go to give them the call bell with a cleaner, clean hand. Okay. Okay. That was kind of, that was the discussion earlier about, they get confused. Yeah, they do. They do. So, um, Mary has a student that failed range of motion the first time. She filed a complaint as neither of us could figure out why she failed. Evaluated to take notes. Um, and my notes are very cryptic because everything's going so fast. So when I get to range of motion, if it, the support was the reason they failed, I put, um, okay, I give an example. Range of motion of the shoulder. Uh, they have to support the wrist and at the elbow. Some people support it the hand. If they're holding the hand, I've had that. If they're holding the up this way. So it's very specific in the book on what they have to support. So when you file your grievance, um, Credential will contact the evaluator and want to know what caused them to fail that step. And the evaluator should be able to email back exactly. And we also put it in our paperwork as to why they failed the step as well at the end of the day whenever we're submitting it. Positioning on the side is different in the handbook and the skills checkbook checklist, maybe. So I think in the curriculum skills, it's more involved. But remember, the handbook is modified. So that's the thing you have to do. You're teaching them to be nurse aides, to take care of patients. So when you come back from clinical, you need to tell them, now I'm going to teach you how to take the test. And they have to take the test by the book. Whenever you have candidates that come in and say, let me uh, check your arm band, this arm band, there's nowhere it says that you check the that you check your client's arm band. Um, like applying the knee high test documents, you explain the procedure, you provide privacy. The first two steps doesn't say that you um, apply, that you verify who they are. Uh, it would be fabulous if credential evaluator could do a Zoom in, in service on the tested skills. We did that back in 2013 with DPI in person. Um, I, I can't say this, but they don't want to give away a lot of that. Well, I'm going to say it. I don't think they want to give away a lot of their secrets. Um, but maybe we can put something together where um, we can talk about the skills more because evaluators are not allowed to give away all the secrets. But in my role, I am in a different role here talking to you guys so I can provide you a lot of the information. Um, so let, let me think on that and how we can get that done. You guys, I did put in our contact for Goodhart Wilcox. That is our new representative for North Carolina. Um, this is a touchy situation, though, because I technically cannot talk or recommend any textbooks that might be related to Health Science Warner Biomedical Technology because we're in what's called a textbook freeze. However, Nursing Fundamentals does not qualify under that textbook freeze. So, when you do reach out, make sure they know that you're referencing the nursing book, and that's it. Um, just because we can't have you guys ask for any books in that right now through, I think, the end of September, first or middle of October. Um, but 
nursing books are obviously something you could ask about, but that is her con link to her contact information. So Claire wants to know, can they use sanitizer instead of soap and water? When whenever you're washing your hands in between skills, you just say wash hands. We don't want you to go back to the sink to wash hands again. And that is part of their instructions that they're given. To just say wash hands. For testing, we are telling them in between when once they say my skill is complete, and this is what the changes are now doing testing, the candidate and the client both have to use hand sanitizer. We're no longer wearing gloves. That came out, I think, sometime in April, May, that we switched from using hand sanitizer to gloves. We're still wearing masks during testing. Now, I will remind you guys that uh, the last time I tested, which was two weeks ago, I had a couple candidates to show up without masks. So as evaluators, we are told to tell them they can't test without a mask. You have time to go get a mask. But I was at Wake Tech. They provide masks for any of the candidates. They have masks in the lab for us to give out. But not all test sites are going to do that. So remind your students that even though things are lifting, um, the precautions and uh, restrictions are lifting, we are still required, as of today, might change to, uh, on Sunday when I get my email from Pearson View, my uh, newsletter. But as of today, we're still wearing masks during testing. So our time is winding down. I will be available on Friday. We have an hour where you can come back and ask more questions. I think it's an hour. Uh, on Friday afternoon. Um, where you can ask more questions. And if there's not a lot of questions about a lot of stuff, I may just spend time on skills, going over some of the things, since that seems to be a hot topic. We have five minutes left. Hey, Barbara. Uh-huh. Hey, it's Michelle Collins. I've been trying to jump in here. I just wanted to tell you a best practice that my kids and I developed about um, leaving your patient. We call it the five P's and two L's. Um, before they leave their patient, they ask the patient, are you in pain? Um, do you need to have your position changed? Do you need to go potty? Do you have any possessions that you need? And please call me before you try to get out of bed. Those are your five P's. It reminds them to give the call bell. It reminds them to put the overhead table back in place, things like that. And then the two L's are lower and locked bed is lowered and locked in position and that really mnemonic helped them this last time get all the steps in for leaving their patient uh patient's room michelle isn't that what uh cone requires it was actually something that was started to be developed at baptist before i left there gotcha. um they, okay. but their p's are a little bit different than what we did uh, but it is something they're using in in the main hospitals now yeah, yeah, that's what that's what I thought when I had done some work with Cone. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Thank you for that reminder. Robin, you see that little microphone? There should be an X over it. If you want to unmute from there, let me see if you unmute it. My buddy here is getting down at the very bottom. You should have a plus sign. Um, microphone leave audio stop sharing webcam you should have a line over the microphone if you click on that that will unmute you come here toby got it thank you uh-huh monica i'm gonna send toby your way so i'm gonna stop recording